Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to one of the more anthologized poems from Drum Tap section, The Artilleryman's Vision. This is poem number 27 of the 43 of Drum Taps. It is another powerful scene type of poem of Whitman's. Again, we commented already in earlier discussions of the influence that photography would have on Whitman and his poetics, especially these poems of drum taps. I want to remind you that Whitman said into the old cause of poem much earlier in Leaves of Grass that my book and the war are one. The ways in which that is true is how we are trying to understand drum taps. I just want to remind you guys of a couple of lines that we already have seen in Song of Myself. First of all, I want to go to part four where he says, battles, he says, the horrors of fratricidal war, the fever of doubtful news, the fitful events, these come to me days and nights and go from me again, but they are not the me, myself, capital M, me. Apart from the pulling and hauling stands where I am, stands amused, complacent, compassionating, idle, unitary, looks down as a rector bends an arm on an impalpable certain rest, looking with side curved head, curious what will come next, a, a word curious that we've seen so many times in drum taps, both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it. Backward I see in my own days where I sweated through fog, We've heard of this several times in drum taps. With linguists and contenders, I have no mockings or arguments. I witness and wait. And do you remember what we call passage 18 of Song of Myself 33? I am an old artillerist. I tell of my fort's bombardment. I'm there again. Again, the long roll of the drummers. Again, the attacking cannon mortars. Again, to my listening ear, the cannon responsive. I take part, I see and hold and hear the whole. The cries, curses, roars. The plantons for well-armed shots, the ambulanza slowly passing, uh, trailing its red drip. Workmen searching after damages, making indispensable repairs. The fall of grenades through the rent roof, the fan-shaped explosion, the whiz of limbs, heads, stone, wood, iron, high in the air. Again, gurgles the mouth of my dying general. He furiously waves with his hand. He gasps through the clot, mind not me, mind the entrenchments. Now. Our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt. And we've worked with everything from the early inscriptions poems up to and including an introductory set of comments for drum taps, and then finally, Old General at Bay. Our Nortons will tell us about this poem in our background history here, that originally the veterans' vision, this poem took its present title with very minor changes in 1871. It is essentially based on some 30 manuscript lines set down by Whitman in a Washington notebook of 62, 1863. Now, Whitman is accorded to have said, the real war will never get into books. I think what he's trying to do in drum taps is to amend that idea. Let's take a look at it now, and as we read, we'll annotate. It begins with a very interesting, quiet, domesticated image. While my wife at my side lies slumbering, and the wars are over long, notice plural, wars, and my head on the pillow rests at home, and the vacant midnight passes, and through the stillness, again, a key concept in Leaves of Grass. I think that T.S. Eliot learned this idea, and that's why he says, we must be still and still moving into another intensity at the conclusion of East Coker. I hear, just hear, the breath of my infant. Think about father and son, think about, or, or father and child, think about generational understandings here. There in the room, as I wait from sleep, this vision presses upon me. So notice the framing sequence of this, of this poem. So, in other words, in the stillness and the quiet of the, early, of the early morning, all of a sudden I have this vision. The engagement opens there and then in fantasy, Unreal, and I think the word unreal will take us back to our Dante, our, to our Dante, right? The skirmishes begin. They claw curiously ahead. I hear the irregular snap, snap. I hear the sounds of the different missiles, the short This will be al uh, along with here later in the poem. The only time that Whitman really plays that game thus far in, in Leaves of Grass of the rifle balls. I see the shells exploding, leaving small white clouds. I hear the great shells shrieking as they pass. Only use of the word shrieking in all of Lisa Grass. The grape 
like the hum and whir of wind through the trees. We think of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, Passage 5, when he makes a reference of the wind blowing through the trees. Tumultuous, now the contest rages. In other words, we have a person who many years before experienced what now he's going back to relive. All, an important word as we've said in Lisa Grass, all the scenes of the batteries rise in detail before me again. The crashing and smoking, the pride of the men in their pieces, the chief gunner ranges and sights his piece and selects a fuse of the right time. Notice the, the, the intricate detail, detail of the technology. After firing, notice the, 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 the eye here. After firing, I see him lean aside. Remember the, the leaning that was happening in, uh, in, in Song of Myself 4? Now it's, we're back to it. Only completely different. After firing, I see him lean aside and look eagerly off to note the effect. In other words, who did we who, who did we destroy? Who did we destroy, right? Elsewhere, I hear the cry. In other words, notice, this is like multiple things happening on the battlefield that we want to emphasize. I hear the cry of a regiment charging. And then in parenthetics, the young colonel leads uh, himself this time with brandished sword. Again, we're back to the conclusion of Song of uh, Myself, uh, passage 33. Um, I see the gaps cut by the enemy's volleys, quickly filled up, no delay. In other words, as people fall, more will fill. This, this idea that it's a never-ending kind of slaughter. I breathe the suffocating smoke, then the flat clouds hover. Notice we have clouds several times. That, that fog, as we, as we have talked about it in drum taps. Hover low, concealing all. Can't see anything. It takes us again back to the opening lines of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Now, and again, to, to, to uh, make it immediate. A strange lull for a few seconds. Not a shot fired on either side. This lull will take us back to Dalliance of Eagles. Then, resumed. And I think the poem, Dalliance of Eagles, I mean, go back to that poem and then read this section, and you're like, hmm, it's very interesting how... We've got a similar kind of thing happening in Dalliance of Eagles where there's all this energy, energy action, and then there's this pause or lull, and then there's more energy action. Then resumed the chaos louder. The only time chaos gets used this way in Lisa Grass is right here. Then ever, louder than ever. With eager calls and orders of officers, while from some distant part of the field, the wind wafts to my ears a shout of applause. Some special success is set off in parenthetics. And ever the sound of the cannon far or near the power of the technology. Rousing, notice again in parenthetics, rousing even in dreams, a devilish exultation and all the old mad joy in the depths of my soul in parenthetic. Now this is maybe the most troubling line of artillerymen's vision. Of course, devilish will take us back to Song of Joys. Old mad joy will be used one time in Leaves of Grass and it's right here. But notice what he's suggesting. There's something exciting, although horrifying, about what is going on right here. And ever the hastening of infantry, shifting positions, batteries, cavalry, moving hither and thither. Notice the constant movement. And then again in parenthetics, there's, this, there's these asides. The falling, dying, I heed not. Now this I heed not we're going to come back to with as I lay with my head in your lap, camarero. I heed not and have never heeded. I heed not the wounded dripping in red. I heed not. Some to the rear are hobbling. Now this is of course in diametric contrast to what we've seen earlier in drum taps when he has shown us so closely uh, March Unknown, Vigil Strange, all of those poems that we've seen, the hard ones, really the hard ones to read, where he gives us vivid detail that he does heed, only here, I heed not, and then he gives it to us. Grind, heat, rush, aid de camps galloping by, or on a full run, with the patter of small arms, the warning, s notice that S dash, S dash, T. Again, the only time in Leaves of Grass that we'll see this kind of game being played of the rifles, and then one more parenthetic, these in my vision I hear or see in parenthetic, and bombs bursting, by the way, bombs will be used one time in all of Leaves of Grass, one time in drum taps, and it's right here. And bombs bursting in air, of course this makes us think of the Star Spangled Banner, and I think this is exactly what Whitman wants us to think about in those early 
um, those, those early kinds of contests in the revolutionary experience. Bursting in air, and at night, the very colored rockets. Rockets gets used one time in Leaves of Grass, and it is right here. Well, what are we going to say about a poem like this? Again, this is kind of a disturbing poem for some readers for different reasons. There seems to be almost a celebration of the chaos, is the word he uses, or catastrophe of war. I think Whitman is, in fact, saying something quite different. I think he's arguing that the horrors of war never end, that we do have individuals who go through these experiences and they have to struggle with post-traumatic stress, that they're, it's horrifying, but it's also exhilarating, and how do I deal with that? And the fact that I'm not heeding the, the, the wounded, the, tor the hobbling, the, the, the tortured dead and dying. Uh, I think another message here is it's often in quiet moments that the hell returns. And, of course, anyone who has spent time in the theater of war will often come back to report that this is the hardest. When it's quiet, when it's still, those images come back that have to be re relived. At 2B, I, I love this idea that Whitman is going to try to capture the sound of the war with his uh, th and his, th, you know, try to capture the idea of the, of, of the uh, uh, bullets uh, going through the air. At uh, 3A, well, I, obviously we can think of Crane's Red Badge of Courage as a primary exemplar. Uh, uh, I, I want to mention, though, a couple of poems that we have uh, exegeted at LearnStrong.net. Dolce et Decorum S is, is the great Wilfred Owen poem uh, about, real, uh, if you want to celebrate war, then you might want to read that poem first kind of thing. And then Wirers by Siegfried Sasson, I think, is as well. That, that, um, that voice, as we comment on it when we talk about it at Learn Strong, that, that voice that is taken by Sasson of, this is the way things are, and you know, people are uh, people in the middle of this, I, I'm kind of like almost a cavalier um, feeling about the, 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 so much catastrophe, so much chaos, so much dying. Finally, at 3B, what was a time that you journeyed back to a hard or a difficult vision, and how did you deal with that? And finally, what are your thoughts about those who are having to deal with uh, uh, post-traumatic stress? And do you think poems like this in drum taps um, help, or do they educate? And maybe they're educating us. I hope. I hope that's the case. Thank you.